Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're just going to take a moment as everyone files in from the waiting room. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. We're gonna to take a moment as people file in from the waiting room, we'll get started momentarily. All right, well, thanks so much for being here with us today. This is the webinar on the California End of Life Option Act and how to access it. I'm Christina Goodwin. I'm the California and Hawaii State Manager, and I will be your moderator today. To ask a question at any time, just type it into the Q&A box on your screen and click send. We will be getting to questions at the end of the presentation. And don't get worried if you see that your question gets dismissed. We copy all of the questions and put it into a document just to streamline our questions at the end. And just note that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, we cannot see your, your cameras, your screens are not on and you are muted. So don't worry if you um, are not ready to be recorded at the moment. Today, we're gonna to have a couple of speakers. I'm gonna be joined by Sam Trad, who is the California and Hawaii State Director for Compassion and Choices. And we're also gonna be joined by one of our storytellers, Tom Whaley, whose wife, Christine, accessed the End of Life Option Act medication in 2018. Compassion and Choices is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit working to improve care and expand options at the end of life. We believe in patient-centered care where the person is in charge of making their own healthcare decisions and that they work in accordance with their doctors and medical team so that they know the full range of end-of-life options. Before we get started, I did wanna ask a polling question. Leslie, if you could bring it up. And the question's gonna be, how familiar are you with medical aid in dying? Are you very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar? <clears throat> and give folks just a moment as the responses are coming in. We're at close to 80%. All right, we can um, go ahead and show the results, Leslie. And it looks like 76% are somewhat familiar, 20% are very familiar, and then 4% not at all familiar. We're, we are so glad that you're here, um, and hopefully you can learn more about end-of-life options and the End-of-Life Option Act during this presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sam. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Christina. All right, so I have a question for everyone here today. Um, so if this is true, I want you to think if it's true for you or not. How many of you here today are going to die? Anybody? All right, I know it's a little corny, but death is something we don't usually like to think about um, or talk about. But the good news is, is that talking about death won't actually cause you to die any faster. In fact, talking about death can be incredibly helpful because it helps you think through what you or your loved ones may want at the end of life. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question now, and I, I think it comes with a poll question. When you do die, how do you want to die? Take a minute and just imagine where you wanna be at the end of your life. Do you want to be at home with loved ones? Do you want your pain and discomfort managed? Do you wanna be in a hospital or facility? Or do you have another preference? And you can choose more than one. All right. Just about everyone has voted. And it looks like the majority of people want to die in a hospital hooked up to machines. No, bad joke. 
Um, the majority of people want to be at home with loved ones and with their pain and discomfort managed. That's what we hear all the time. That's what all the surveys show. Um, but in reality, many people end up dying in a hospital hooked up to machines in exactly the way they didn't want. And that's why it's so important to be able to talk about your different end of life options, what's available to you and to learn how you can um, access those options. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the different end of life options. Uh, one is all medical treatment interventions possible. And we fully support people's choice to receive every medical treatment possible and to die in an ICU if that's what they want. But I suspect many of us don't want that. Compassion and Choices is working hard to make sure you have options for the peaceful death of your choosing. There's refusing or discontinuing treatment. Every adult has the right to refuse unwanted medical treatment. This is part of every individual's right to choose what will be done to his or her own body. And it applies even when refusing treatment means that the person may die. There's hospice, which includes an interdisciplinary team of caregivers providing comfort, support, and dignity to terminally ill people when medical treatment is no longer expected to cure the disease or prolong life. And this service most often takes place in the home. And I do wanna say with hospice, you know, all of these options are not mutually exclusive. We do recommend, you know, if someone is doing voluntarily stopping eating and drinking that they also are on hospice. V said, which is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, it's a legal right for any individual who wishes to shorten their dying process by refusing nourishment or orally or through a tube. And it's a peaceful way to control the dying process if done under medical supervision. This can be a compassionate option for people with dementia. And we do offer presentations specifically about VSED. And we'll talk more about that near the end of the presentation. There's palliative sedation or deep sedation, which is the continuous administration of medication to relieve severe intractable symptoms that cannot be controlled. This unconscious or semi-conscious state is maintained until death occurs. And then there's medical aid in dying. And while hospice and palliative care can help most people most of the time, for some, it's not enough. And for them, medical aid in dying should be an option. So medical aid in dying is authorized here in the great state of California. This is a picture of Governor Gray Davis in 2015 um, signing the bill, which would later become law and go into effect in June of 2016. Governor Davis said that he, he wasn't sure whether or not he would use this option, but he knew that he would want to be afforded the right to have it as an option if he wanted. In fact, in California, we know from an extensive study that the California Healthcare Foundation did at the end of 2019 that 75% of Californians want the option of medical aid in dying. In fact, the majority of every demographic, Asian Pacific Islander, Black, Latino, White, want the option of medical aid in dying as it is under the End of Life Option Act. Nine states have authorized medical aid in dying. It all started over 20 years ago in Oregon. Oregon was the first state to authorize it. And since then, um, we now have nine states in Washington, D.C. all have similar medical aid in dying laws to Oregon's law. And there are more already, um, you know, just this week and last week, more states filing bills to authorize medical aid in dying. In fact, New York is very close, I think. So what do we mean when we use the term medical aid in dying? As I mentioned earlier, medical aid in dying is one of many end of life options. It's a medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less to live may receive a medication which they can choose to self ingest to bring about a peaceful death. 
Medical aid in dying does not cause more people to die. It allows fewer people to suffer. Thank you, Christina. And I just realized I said Governor Davis and I meant Governor Brown. I don't know if Mercury's in retrograde, but I apologize. I absolutely know that was Governor Brown. I was trying to remember his quote and I said the wrong name. So um, thank you for your patience with me today. Um, other important provisions of the law. It's really important to understand that medical aid in dying is not considered suicide or assisted suicide. People who want the option of medical aid in dying are already dying. Their terminal illness has robbed them of life. They don't want to die. What they do want is to be able to control the end of their life, which their terminal illness has completely robbed them of. It's also important to note that wills, contracts, insurance, and annuity policies are not affected. The death certificate lists the underlying illness. It doesn't say medical aid in dying. It says the terminal illness that the person must have in order to qualify for medical aid in dying. In fact, just having the prescription gives dying patients a great sense of relief. Not everyone who goes through the whole process to get their medication even actually takes the medication. We know from data from um, the Department of Health across the country that nearly one third of patients who get their medication never take it. Uh, and again, just having it gives them such a huge sense of relief. I talked to one person who told me that they never felt more alive than the moment they got their medication. And he said, I know that sounds totally crazy and I hope I never have to use it, but the fact that he had it there in his home and he could take it if he absolutely needed to, helped him to live out his final weeks and days without having to worry about what course his terminal illness would take him on. So how do you qualify for medical aid in dying? Well, in order to be able to obtain a prescription, you need to be a California resident, you need to be 18 years or older, you need to be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live, you need to be capable of making medical decisions. That means that this is not an option for people with Alzheimer's or advanced dementia. You need to understand the decision you're making to choose medical aid in dying. You also need to be able to self ingest the medication. There's no assistance when it comes to medical aid in dying. So if you meet all of those requirements, you can ask your doctor for a prescription and pick it up the next day. No, you can't, that's not true. Many people think it's that easy, that as long as you meet these eligibility requirements, you can just ask for the medication when you need it. In fact, it can take quite a long time to access the law, and that's why it's so important that you're here today, because it can be very complicated to get a prescription for medical aid in dying. So what are the steps? I'm going to give you the cliff notes, and we will send you a follow-up email with a little booklet that can take you through the process in order to obtain medical aid in dying. First of all, the most important thing is to talk with your doctor. If you think you may ever want the option of medical aid in dying, talk to your doctor today. A lot of doctors have never even thought about medical aid in dying. Some don't even realize it's authorized in the state of California. So it's really important for you to, to know clearly from your doctor if they would support you in medical aid in dying if you were to qualify for the law. I myself have talked to my doctor and he was shocked. He had never had anyone ask him about it before and I'm not sick. And I made it very clear, you know, if I were to meet the eligibility requirements, would you support me? And after he thought about it a lot, thankfully he said he would. And I hope that I never have to go on that journey with him, um, but I'm relieved to know that he would support me if I needed him to. If your doctor says no, that they won't support you in the option of medical aid in dying, then it's important to ask why. There are a lot of different reasons why a doctor might say no. First of all, is your doctor allowed to prescribe? There are some healthcare systems and hospices that don't let their doctors prescribe medical aid in dying even if they want to. Now, any doctor can opt out if they want, but not every doctor can support you if they want to. So we know that 97% of religious healthcare systems in California don't let their doctors prescribe. So I can tell you right now, if you're at a Dignity Health or an Adventist healthcare center, chances are your doctor's not allowed to support you in this option. In fact, they may not even be able to talk to you about it. 
Find out, are you their first patient requesting medical aid in dying like I was with my doctor? Maybe they don't know what it really is or how it works. We have really great materials that we can share with you that you can take to your doctor to talk to them about it and see if maybe, you know, once they've thought about it, like my doctor, they'll change their mind and support you. We have a great free confidential consultation line called doc to doc this is for medical providers who can call, and especially doctors, and talk to another doctor who has a lot of experience supporting patients in the option of medical aid and dying and can mentor your doctor through the process so they know what to expect. You can ask your doctor to refer you to a doctor who will support you. Um, I know it can be really difficult and scary when your doctor says no, if your doctor says no, but hopefully that doctor will refer you to somebody else who will support you so that you don't get lost trying to find someone to support you. You know, it can be really difficult to find a doctor when you're healthy and it's 10 million times harder when you're ill. Finally, we have a confidential consultation line called our end of life consultation line that you can call if you need help with any end of life questions. The way it works is you'll leave a message and you'll get a call back in 24 to 48 hours. And we'll send you all this information afterwards. So don't worry if I'm going too fast. So next steps. First, we've established the most important thing, talk to your doctor, talk to your doctor, talk to your doctor. Um, find a doctor who will help you with the process and write the prescription for you if you qualify. Then you need to have a second doctor confirm your eligibility. Now that first doctor who's gonna end up being your prescribing doctor should help you with this process. Um, but if not, just know you are gonna need two different doctors to confirm your eligibility. Then you need to have, you need to make a second request to the doctor who will ultimately write the prescription separated by a mandatory minimum of 15 days. So the way it works is you have to have two oral requests to one doctor, the main doctor who will write the prescription, and it has to be separated by 15 days. Now, this is also another hurdle that we know there are people who don't survive that 15-day waiting period. So again, the sooner you can start the process, the better. You can get the medication, and then you can decide if you want to take it or not um, after you have it. I obviously, don't try to get it unless you want to take it. but um, you don't wanna wait till the last minute. You also have two written requests, one that needs to be done before you get your prescription. It has to be signed by two different qualified witnesses and there's different reasons for the, the witnesses so that um, you can confirm that you're not um, being coerced by anyone and you submit it to your doctor. So it may sound very challenging to access the law and it can be, but we do know that it's possible. So as you can see here in 2019, um, it, the data from the California Department of Public Health, 618 people received prescriptions for medical aid in dying. Those prescriptions were written by 246 different physicians. Of the people who received prescriptions, 405 of them took their medication. We also have data from the first three and a half years of the option being in effect. And we know that nearly 2000 prescriptions were written between June 2016 and December 31st, 2019. Um, and we know that of those patients, 1,112 were enrolled in hospice. And we encourage everyone to enroll in hospice if you plan on pursuing medical aid and dying. So start talking. It's important to talk to your doctor, but it's also important to talk to your loved ones uh, so that they know that this option is important to you and why it's important to you so that they can be there for you and support you when you reach the end of life. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Whaley, who's gonna talk to us about his experience with his wife who wanted the option of medical aid and dying. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sam. Um, hi everyone, I'm Tom. Um, that, that's my late wife, Christine, right there, standing with me in the Grand Canyon. Um, that was a beautiful day, but it was, it was before we began our journey, or she began her journey, me along with her. Um, in 2012, Christine was diagnosed with um, malignant melanoma. It started as a, a small lesion on the back of her neck, and um, 
it spread quickly. She went through lymphectomies where they removed all the lymph nodes out of her shoulder. She went through multiple surgeries um, and then started clinical trials at one point because they weren't sure what they could do about it. They didn't want to do the traditional route of chemo. Um, but we found a good oncologist that Christine liked. Um, he was a kind of no-nonsense, science-y kind of guy that fit with her personality, and, and we started the journey. Um, and that was in the fall of 2012. Um, Christine was a fighter. She, she, she struggled. She, she wanted to live. She wanted to be here. She wanted to do things. So we went through, oh my goodness, at least three different experimental procedures um, over the next few years. And uh, we did things that were on our bucket list. We took a trip to Thailand at one point. We figured out how to squeeze it between treatments at one point when she was feeling halfway decent. Um, and some of them worked. Some of these treatments removed the cancer from out of her abdomen, from out of her shoulders. Um, but it kept popping back up in her head. And we could never find a treatment that would stop its growth in her brain. We went through gamma radiations where she had to be strapped to like a gurney and they fire gamma rays in and it blasts something inside of her brain. And those are hard to watch. Those are hard to, 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 to work with. Um, but she kept fighting, she kept fighting. Um, and during this process, I remember when the um, voting for the End of Life Option Act for medical aid and dying, I remember voting for that. And, but I didn't really think anything of it at the time. I just thought, oh, that's the right thing to do. I'll vote for this. And then when Christine started getting closer, she started saying, well, I guess you should start figuring out what this is. Um, I know it's law now, so let's go take advantage of it and see what my doctor says. And we're five and a half, almost six years into it at this point. So she reached out to our, her oncologist and he's like, I can't even talk to you about this. I'm not even gonna talk to you about this. Um, we had not realized that during the time he was our oncologist, his practice had got bought and his new healthcare system not allow him to even prescribe or talk about it. Um, and so then we began a journey of figuring out what do we do at this point? Like, how do we move forward? Who do we talk to when our own, own oncologist won't talk to us? Um, we started trying to talk to the local hospices in our area. So I should sort of press this by, I live in kind of a rural remote area, San Luis Obispo, California. We're about halfway between San Francisco and LA. It's three and a half, four hours, either one. Not a big area. A couple hundred thousand people live in our county. Um, we have two medical systems in our city um, and neither one was willing at that time to even talk about it. This is in the spring of 2018. Um, we tried talking to hospices in our area. Um, the medical hospices in our area were not in favor of this at the time. Um, but finally, we found compassion and choices. They were able to help guide Christine in some tips, um, things she could do. She, we started going back to the doctors she did have a, um, a prior experience with, and we realized that and a lot of our trips to UCLA, UCLA were for medical consul, um, consults. Um, they were for uh, getting surgeries down there and second opinions from some of the best um, melanoma patient, uh, doctors in the nation. And, um, and Usalia was willing to help with, help us. Um, but at this point, Christine was still struggling, trying to make it work, trying to live, um, but she kept deteriorating and deteriorating. Um, and so at one point we finally made the trip down to UCLA. Um, those were hard trips. It's three and a half hours of no traffic longer. And Christine was in a really bad shape at this point. She had a, a wound back attached to her head. She'd had multiple brain surgeries at this point. Um, she wasn't moving very well. And somehow we had to get her into a car and drive down to UCLA just for a quick short appointment to talk to a doctor and then drive all the way back. And um, only to find out on the way back that um, that day the healthcare, the system had actually been temporarily put on hold due to a court case. Um, and that really bothered Christine. <laughs> she had finally, finally gotten a doctor that could support her and talk to her. And she got in a second that would support her in this decision. And we had talked to social workers to work through the witnesses system. And we're talking months here. We're not talking, this is a simple process. We're talking months to make this happen. Um, and then it got put on hold temporarily. And so we didn't know it was gonna come back. Um, Christine wanted to go her own way. She, she had watched her, 
her grandmother die a slow death from cancer. Um, and she didn't want to go that path. She had seen her grandmother hooked up to tubes and be um, a slow, painful, hard family kind of death. And Christine wanted to go out her own way. She had had so much taken from her as far as choices about the cancer that she decided she wanted life to end on her own terms. And I think that's important to recognize that she didn't want to die, but since she was going to die, she wanted to go the way she felt comfortable. She wanted to go in her own way, in her own control. Um, not, not her dignity, not her, her choice being taken from her about how she went. And so as this progressed, finally the law got help held by the state Supreme Court and um, UCLA reached back out and said, okay, now you can come down for your second visit. So we piled back in the car, made an expensive journey down to UCLA again to talk to all the doctors again and um, get a prescription. Um, and at this time we're talking, we're at late July, early August. I don't remember the exact date. That's one of those two weeks, last week of July, first week of August that she finally got the prescription and the joy on her face that she had relief that she could choose when and how, as opposed to her choice being taken from her. She, she was, um, I guess just pure relief, if you can see that's a word. You can see in someone's face when you know that they can pick their own route. Um, they can be control of their own destiny. Um, and so we traveled home that day um, with her prescription. Um, and things did get worse over the next couple of weeks. And on August um, 25th, 2018, was what I call Christine's death day. Um, she woke up, well, we had planned a couple days ahead so her brother could travel to be here. Um, and so he was in town. And then that morning we woke up, she had her morning cup of water. <laughs> she wasn't doing your coffee at that point anymore. Um, she put on her Pandora playlist that she wanted. She wanted the sounds and, and situation that she wanted. She had said goodbye to her, her close friends. And um, we sat in the living room and cried and talked together. Um, and 10 o'clock AM rolled around and she was ready. Um, so Christine began that journey. Um, I laid down with her, her dog in her lap. Um, and she ingested the medication. It was peaceful and it was serene as the way she wanted to go. With the soundtrack playing in the background, it was what she wanted. It wasn't in a hospital. It wasn't being, she, the tumor had traveled down around her neck and was starting to suffocate. It wasn't, so she was su suffocating. It wasn't that she had, couldn't get food down anymore, but she was within days of that. She chose when she went and how she went. And so she was able to, I guess it's kind of like one last little, hurrah over the cancer for her, um, that she had gone the way she wanted to go in, in her way. Um, but along the way, Christine had made it be known in our local community how, how this experience was. She wrote up in the paper. Um, she talked to doctors and nurses locally. Um, she talked to her friends vocally on Facebook and in the area saying, hey, this is my legal options in California. Why can I not find this in my local area? What's going on? Um, why does it have to be difficult that someone like me who's struggling and fighting and has given everything she had of her life to be here can't go the way she wants to go in a legal way that's legal for her in our area to go? Um, why does it have to be so difficult for someone who's at the end of their life, who's already having troubles moving about, troubles living? Why does she have to fight to die? Um, so those were, were powerful questions in our community and cause a lot of hospices and doctors to step back and think. So talk to your doctor, see what your doctor supports. As you get close, talk to find a hospice, talk to your hospices, see what you want in your life, whether it's voluntary stopping eating and drinking, whether it's medical aid and dying, whatever route you're going to, talk to your doctor about where you're headed and what they will support you in. Um, it's not an easy journey. It may sound like a quick thing, but Sam, Sam's right. The cliff notes are spot on. It just takes a while. It's a rigorous process, but it's the right way for many people um, if they choose it because it's legally theirs. Um, so that was Christine's journey. Um, 
afterwards, we had a little butterfly release with the kids. Um, and they got to say their goodbyes in a way that worked for us that day. I, I think that's all I want to share. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind everybody we'll be taking questions at the end. So if you have any questions, you can write them into the text box at any time where it says Q&A and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So how can you help? Um, first of all, tell your doctor that medical aid in dying is an important option for you. I don't know if we've mentioned that yet today. Uh, and ask if they will support you in your decision. So even if you don't want the option of medical aid and dying, it's really important to talk to your doctor to make sure they will support you in the options that you think you might want at the end of your life. You can always volunteer with us. We have the best volunteers in the world, I think. Um, and there's a lot of different volunteer opportunities depending on what you're interested in doing. Um, but there's there's still a lot of um, outreach and education that needs to be done across the state. So if you want to volunteer with us, please, please volunteer. You can connect us with groups or organizations that would like to have a speaker to give a presentation. All of our presentations are free. This is what we do. And we're happy to talk to people about end of life options. Connect us with medical professionals who want to learn more about the law. So we also do um, clinical webinars as well as talk, really nerdy talk about policies and procedures with healthcare systems and hospices because their, their policies and procedures are really important. We wanna make sure that they do let their doctor support patients in the option and, and that there is a process. So if a doctor doesn't feel comfortable and wants to opt out that they will refer that patient to another doctor who will support them so that everyone can have the end of life experience that they want. And share your story. Uh, this is such a beautiful picture of Brittany Menard and Dan Diaz. You may remember Brittany, um, her story went viral when she was 29 years old before California had the law. Uh, she had a terrible form of brain cancer and ended up moving to Oregon to access their law and fought for California and other states to have laws like Oregon. And Brittany said, having this choice at the end of my life has become incredibly important. Who has the right to tell me that I don't deserve this choice? If you have a personal story that you would like to share about your end of about your loved one's end of life experience, um, or if you're seeking an end of life option, let us know and we're happy to, to work with you. Um, so we do have resources on our website. You can go to compassionandchoices.org forward slash California. You'll find information, resources, and tools specific to our state in the End of Life Option Act. And we also have an end of life consultation program you'll see the toll-free number on the slide, and they provide confidential, non-judgmental information on the full range of end-of-life options. Uh, they will help you with end-of-life planning and um, from anywhere in the country. Um, just so you know, it is a, um, it's a service. You leave your, your message and they'll get back to you within one to two business days. We do have resources that are available in um, English, Spanish, Chinese, um, and those are also available on our website. Uh, we have our COVID-19 toolkit, which is extremely pertinent and popular right now. It is available in English and Spanish, and it doesn't include an addendum to your advanced healthcare directive in case you do contract uh, COVID-19. We also offer um, presentations tailored to your organization. We can present virtually to your local church, community organization, or service organization. Our topics include advanced healthcare planning, preparing for dementia, and end-of-life options, including medical aid and dying. Uh, which also includes information about voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Uh, this link will be sending it, it out after the presentation. Sam, do you wanna talk about our upcoming events? Yes, thanks, Christina. 
Uh, we're very excited to announce that on Thursday, February 11th, we are going to have an update on the End of Life Option Act with Senator Telemontes Eggman. Uh, you may remember her as being Assemblymember Eggman, but she recently won her Senate race. Um, back when Senator Eggman was an assembly member, she was one of the lead authors of the End of Life Option Act. So she's going to be updating everyone the morning of February 11th to talk about how the law is working here in California. And on Tuesday, February 16th, we'll have our next California new volunteer training, if you're interested in volunteering with us. We also have some exciting webinars coming up. Um, actually, on February 4th, there's going to be, uh, it's not on here, but we'll put it in the follow-up email. There's a webinar with the City of Hope on um, how uh, medical aid and dying really works in access states. Um, and we'll be hearing from a doctor, et cetera, who will be talking about his experience. Then on March 4th, there's a webinar on cinema at the end of life, April 1st, palliative hospice care emergencies, and on May 6th, aid in dying medications and the clinical competencies of prescribing. All of these webinars are available for continuing education credits through the City of Hope. So you can share with your medical provider friends and they're national, so you don't have to be in California. Um, if you are on social media, be sure to follow us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And then we also have our contact information. If you have any follow-up questions or want to reach out to us, please do. We cannot do this work without the support of our generous donors. And there's no donation too small to support the important work that we do. So if you have the capacity to donate to us, we are grateful and um, appreciate all of the support that, that people give to us. And with that, we are at the time for questions. Again, if you have a question, put it into the, the Q&A box and click send, um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, the first question is for Sam. How long does it take to die after voluntarily stopping eating and drinking? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, it really depends on the person where they're at with their terminal illness. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict exactly when the end will come. Um, it is important, obviously, to make sure that you're, you're, you're comfortable and that your pain is being managed. Um, it can be a really beautiful end of life option. And I know for some people, it doesn't sound like it could be beautiful, but it really, it really is as long as your, your pain is managed. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is for Tom. Is there you know, actually, any, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to add, I would encourage anybody who's thinking of, of having that option to um, interview your hospice, find a hospice and make sure that you have hospice there to support you in that end of life option and talk to your medical provider um, to get a sense from them how long it'll take. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, for sure. And for Tom, is there any advice you would give to someone who has a loved one going through the process of accessing medical aid and dying? Um, I know we keep talking about it, but just talk to your doctor. Talk to them early, early. Like, maybe you're along in the process, but if you know people are coming along in the process, like this started, like, have them talk to your doctors. Have them talk to your doctors before you get ill. Um, talk to your doctor now while you're healthy and, and doing well. Um, that's key because if your doctor doesn't support you, you can find a new doctor um, and that's key in your journey um, before you get so invested in a doctor that you're struggling to find someone new when you're really sick. Um, and reach out to like, places like Compassion and Choices. There is help. There is There are people out here who understand what you've been through and um, can help point you in the right direction. So, Thanks, Tom. Sam? What can be done and to whom do we need to speak and write to to make sure medical aid in dying is accessible to all Californians? It's not okay that it is so very difficult. That is a great question and I completely agree. Uh, we do a lot of work here on the ground um, to do what we can do to try to make it easier for people to access the law. Um, but I'd, I'd encourage you to volunteer with us. There's, like I said before, there are different volunteer opportunities. We have 
um, a team of volunteers who call uh, hospices and healthcare systems to make sure they have good policies and procedures in place so that patients are able to access the law. Um, and I'm hopeful, you know, Oregon actually amended their law um, last year. It went into effect where they can waive the mandatory minimum waiting period. So I'm hoping we can do something like that here in California one day. So sign up for our emails and volunteer with us. Uh, the next question we have is more specifically about the um, end of life option process. Is there a format that needs to be followed for the written request when requesting the medication? Does it need to be witnessed or notarized? That's an excellent question. And yes, there are official forms that you need to use for the written request and they need to be signed by two qualified witnesses. And um, there's various uh, requirements for those witnesses like one of them can't be related to you. One of them can't be uh, staff at the at the medical center you're receiving care at. And the, the point of it is to make sure that you aren't being coerced. And I can say that in over 20 years of Oregon's law being in effect, and um, we have 50 combined years of data from all of the authorized states, there's never once been an incident of coercion or abuse. Okay, this question <clears throat> they're asking, if um, they can contact Compassion and Choices for a list of doctors in California who will prescribe the prescription. And another person said they're not very mobile. So how can they find a doctor who's supportive of this option? Mm, great questions. Um, so first of all, our goal at Compassion and Choices is to normalize end of life options, which means that nobody should have to call, you know, a special doctor to be able to access the law Ideally, you shouldn't ever have to leave your, your care team of um, medical providers in order to access the law. And that's really our goal, our long-term goal, um, so that it's just another normal end-of-life option, um, which it really is, right? So um, you can always call our end-of-life consultation line, and we can help you to find um, places where they do allow doctors to practice medical aid in dying, and they can also put you in touch with uh, organizations who can help you find a doctor um, to support you in that. And what was the second question, Christina? Um, someone said they're not very mobile, so how do they find a doctor who's supportive of this option? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, again, if you call our end of life consultation line, um, there are groups that can uh, help you advocate and talk to different medical systems. I will say right now, telehealth has become huge, which is great. And we're really hoping that that'll remain that way so that um, you can use telehealth. Home health is becoming more popular. Um, so these are all different options that, you know, depending on where you get care can be an option for you. Um, but if you need someone to help guide you, then please call our end of life consultation line. Okay, this next question, I think um, both of you can address it. The question is, isn't a healthcare professional required to be in person when the individual ingests the medication? Um, no, they're not required to be there. Um, and in fact, a lot of people prefer not to have any medical professional there present when they take the medication. Um, however, you know, a lot of times people do want a medical provider there just in case having a nurse or um, a death doula. Death doulas are great and there's a lot of great options. And if you, you know, if you need a referral for a death doula, we're happy to um, help you with that. You can get that from our end of life, li uh, end of life consultation line. Um, but, you know, it's really up to the person who is using medical aid and dying, whether or not they want to have um, a medical provider there. It's a very personal decision. And, um, you know, both the doctor and the pharmacist will go over how the medication works, how the person can take it to make sure that the person, um, you know, feels equipped for it. Did you want to add something, Tom? Yeah, I'll just jump in for a second. So our pharmacist did sit down with us and gave um, me very detailed instructions on how this would work out. He, uh, our pharmacist knew that there would be no medical people at Christine's death because she chose not to. And also no one would, um, our hospices didn't support it. And her death doula was through one of those hospices. So the death doula wasn't allowed to, by her hospice wasn't allowed to be here. I think that may have changed some of the hospices recently. So your hospice may or may not allow. Um, ours didn't, 
but Christine, they gave very good instructions. I got to ask a lot of questions. I just had to follow along and um, with some minor preparation and make things happen. Um, I, I would add, oh, I'm sorry, Tom. That's fine. Um, I was just going to say, I would add, you know, you don't know how you're going to feel that the day that your loved one takes medical aid and dying, and it can be very helpful to have somebody there who's, who's been through it before or who, or who is trained. Um, so it's just something else to consider. Yeah. Our death doula showed up within 10 minutes or so after she passed. So that worked out well for us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. So there's a question about telemedicine, which I know is, you know, very popular right now, given, given COVID-19. And can telemedicine um, be legal, legal for physician consultations? Um, so it's important that the, the patient provider relationship has already been established. Um, but if that's established, there are uh, some healthcare systems that do allow telemedicine for um, the medical aid and dying consultations. And I think, did you, did you ask about the witnesses as well? Yeah, can, um, the question was, can Zoom be used for witness conversations? You know, I think that's, that would be a question for your, your medical provider if that's something that they allow. Okay, the next question we have, um, according to the End of Life Option Act, are healthcare systems allowed to keep their staff from providing information on medical aid and dying to their patients? That's a great question. And California is the only state where they are. And this is something that really needs to change because patients should be given um, every bit of information when they're diagnosed with a terminal illness, um, and especially a six month or less prognosis. And so um, unfortunately, there are places where uh, staff are forbidden to even talk to their patients about medical aid and dying in California. Another reason we're trying to do as many presentations, we have public service announcements playing, you know, we're doing everything we can to let people know about this option. Tom, there's a question for you. Since Christine's passing, have you seen an improvement in access to the End of Life Option Act in your area? Um, I think the conversations are key, like letters to the op-ed, speaking out and doing presentations like this. Like I've, we've done presentations with Compassion and Choices in my local area and having doctors and nurses and healthcare systems at, and hospices at those presentations has caused there to be more conversations. And there are now hospices in our local area that will support it. So it's been a, a journey, though, to get there. Um, it's, a, it's still a struggle, don't get me wrong. There's still um, a long ways to go, but there are starting to be glimmers of hope about my local area. So yes, this conversation is better. Thank you. And I'm happy to hear that. Um, Sam, there's a, a question about taking the medication. Is there any consideration of enabling patients with trouble swallowing or intestinal obstruction to be able to have medical aid in dying through a non-oral route? <laughs> Right. Excellent question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, so most patients tend to swallow the medication, but it is possible if you have a feeding tube, as long as the patient is the one who pushes the plunger, then it's still them ingesting the medication themselves. Um, there's also some patients uh, have anal catheters. And again, as long as it's the patient themselves who's taking the medication into their body, um, that is an option. Uh, in fact, we have seen, seen a growing number of ALS patients who've chosen the option of medical aid and dying. Um, so somebody said they want their par partner to see this webinar. Will it be repeated? We are actually recording it. We will be sending it out um, in a follow-up email. So don't worry about that. You can encourage them to watch, the, watch it at their convenience. Uh, there, there's a question about hospices and um, hospices being for-profit, non-profit, and how can we find a good hospice? That's a great question. And um, we have a resource called How to Interview a Hospice that I love. It's a really great resource. And again, you know, starting this process earlier than later, um, it's really important to call around, interview the hospices, find out what's available in your area. We do have um, what we call the find care tool and it will, it lists um, nearby hospices and 
whether or not they allow their doctors to, to prescribe medical aid in dying, whether or not staff are allowed to be present. Um, it's really important to ask hospices, you know, can, can the hospice nurse be there when I take the medication? Because there are some hospices that don't let staff be present um, when the patient takes the medication. Um, you know, and so again, I would just, I, I encourage you to um, call around and we can include that on the follow-up email as well, how to interview a hospice. Um, and again, if you call our end of life consultation line, uh, they're happy to help, help you with that information. Um, so someone's asking about the process of dying once you ingest the medication. Do you fall asleep first? Does your heart stop, your breathing stop? What is the exact process? Um, so usually the patient falls asleep within five to 30 minutes, and then um, eventually they pass away in their sleep. And that can take anywhere from 20 minutes to up to two hours usually. Yeah, just for my, my experience, all I could speak to, Christine fell asleep within five minutes and she passed away peacefully, very peacefully within 25 minutes or so. Thanks, Tom. And um, let's see, there's a question about religious health care system. So how can someone like Dignity Health, who has bought just about everything, prevent their doctors from supporting their patients' requests? Um, so because of freedom of religion, that's why, I guess, um, the short answer um, but I will say there are things that you can do if you're passionate about making sure people have access to the full range of end of life options. Um, we have in the past, the UC health system was determining whether or not to have an overall policy of allowing their facilities to contract with places like Dignity Health. In fact, UC San Francisco had been planning on merging with um, Dignity Health and we worked in a co co coalition with other advocacy organizations um, and thanks to our volunteers who sent hundreds of emails to the board of UC Regents and to the leadership, the president at um, UCSF, we were able to stop that merger. Um, and things like that pop up all the time. And so we're keeping an eye on it. Again, UC Health Systems, they were going to vote on whether or not to allow this to happen. And then when the pandemic hit, it just got kicked down the road. Um, but it's something, again, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your medical providers. You might think you're at UCLA and maybe you're at a facility that's been merged and, um, you know, UCLA does allow their doctors to support patients in medical aid and dying, but, um, you know, it's true. There are religious healthcare systems that are growing. Our president and CEO, Kim Callanan, um, recently wrote a really moving op-ed about it that, um, I encourage you to Google. Tom, there's a question about your kids and I hope you're okay with it. How did your children get involved? How old were they? And how did you prepare them for the process? Um, yeah, it's a good question. That's an interesting journey. Every family's gonna be a little different when it comes to that. Um, at the time, my kids were 14 and 10, um, both my daughters. Um, and we were open with them. We told them about, they saw the suffering every day. They saw the trauma. They saw her journey. Um, and uh, so they got to be part of that journey. Um, and we were honest with them about what her choices were and what she wanted in her life. And um, they were not present when she ingested, but they came right after. Um, that's what worked for our family. Every family could be different. Thank you. Somebody's asking for the end of life consultation line, and that is 800 247 7421. And we can send that out to you um, after, the, after the webinar. Um, there is a question, Tom. If you could make improvements to the end of life option act, what would you um, want to improve? Ooh. <laughs> so there's a couple things I would like to improve. Sam hit, hit on one of them pretty much. I think she hit on both of them, actually. Um, so the mandatory waiting, 15 day waiting period is an interesting thing. Um, there's a lot of trauma that goes on in those 15 days when you don't know if you're going to make it 15 days or not. And I think a lot of people's mental anguish and suffering um, could be alleviated with exceptions or differences made around that somehow. Um, I also think. Um, 
ability to access information, um, knowing which, like if doctors were allowed to talk about it, even though the facility they were in was that that would ease a lot of problems trying to find something because someone won't even answer your phone calls about something that's really, really hard. So uh, those are two things I know that would really help a lot. Um, Sam, there's a question about the medicine. How much does it cost and is it covered by insurance? Great question. Um, there's a few different types of aid in dying medication uh, that a patient will take depending on um, their terminal illness, but it generally costs right now around um, $400. I, I've never heard of a private health insurance that won't cover it, um, but it is something you may want to talk to your insurance company about. Um, Medi-Cal, our state Medicaid does cover medical aid and dying, but the big one, Medicare does not, and that's really important to know. Um, back in the 1990s, when Oregon first passed their law, Congress passed a federal fun funding restriction that does not allow federal money to go towards um, aid and dying. And so Medicare will not cover um, the cost of the aid and dying medication. So most patients either pay out of pocket or they use a private insurance to cover it or Medi-Cal. Um, and there's a question about Kaiser. And if, um, let's see, does Kaiser Healthcare in California support the doctors to participate? Yes, both Kaisers, there's a Kaiser Northern California and a Kaiser Southern California. They have slightly different um, end of life option act processes, but they do allow doctors to support their patients in medical aid and dying. Um, and I will say Kaiser Northern California has had us um, speak to their providers uh, a few times, um, which has been really helpful to hear from them and, um, and for them to hear about the, you know, from us, what the work that we're doing. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, we get this question a lot, so I think it's good to, um, to talk about it. Can medical aid in dying be honored and carried out as listed in a patient's advanced health care directive in a state where it's legal? So um, because you have to be mentally capable and an advanced health care directive is really for when you need someone else to um, help you fulfill your wishes, uh, you really don't need to put it in your advanced health care directive. It's something you have to advocate for yourself. I will tell you, I, I talked to a volunteer recently who told me they put it in their advanced health care directive just because they were so nervous about talking to their doctor about medical aid and dying. It was their way of starting the conversation. Um, so if you're shy or introverted and maybe that's a way to, you know, you can do it, but, but please understand that, you know, if you put it in your advanced healthcare directive, you're not going to be able to access it just from that. You have to go through the whole process, um, yourself. Okay. And there's a question about, um, volunteering for compassion and choices. And yes, um, we love our volunteers, uh, Leslie and I will be more than happy to, um, to reach out to you and to see how you wanna get involved. Uh, we do have action teams across the state and um, to, to sign up to volunteer, go to compassionandchoices.org forward slash volunteer and you'll hear from one of us um, shortly. And I just, I want to just say, Christina and Leslie, they work with our volunteers and they're the best. They're awesome and wonderful to work with. And the reason we do local action teams is because there's different needs depending on where you live. So for example, I live in the Inland Empire in Redlands in Southern California, and there's very little access here. Even the secular medical systems don't let their doctors um, support patients in the option of medical aid and dying. So um, there's a little team of volunteers here who are working on changing that. Um, so that's why having those local action teams is really, um, really helpful. Okay, we'll see if we can get to two more questions. Um, can someone with COVID-19 access medical aid in dying medication if they are dying? Great question. Um, no, the way COVID-19 works is you're not going to meet those eligibility requirements. Um, you don't get diagnosed with a terminal illness or a prognosis of six months or less to live. So medical aid in dying is not an option for patients with COVID-19. And then someone wrote in the, the comments, can you talk about Finish Strong, our, our book, real quick? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Finish Strong is wonderful. It was written by our president emeritus, um, Barbara Coombs-Lee, who has had just an incredible life. 
Um, and you can listen to it on Audible. You can get it online. Um, I think I think from big websites. Um, definitely Amazon. Amazon. I know. I try. I, I, yeah. Um, and it talks about um, the different end of life options that are available. And it also talks about Barbara's experience. But what I like most about it is at the end of each chapter, there's real world advice on what you can do to make sure that your end of life is the experience that you want as best it can. And, um, and that you're there, you know, how to support your loved ones as well. Great, thank you. And um, that is all the time we have for today. I do want to give a special thanks to Tom for joining us today and sharing Christine's story uh, for Sam and just for all of you. I do, before we go, I have one last poll. Uh, Leslie, if you could put it up. Do you find, did you find this presentation informative? Was it very helpful, somewhat helpful, or not at all helpful? And we got um, people are responding. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and close that poll. And I can see, thank you so much. I'm so happy it was very helpful. And, you know, please, we're gonna send, up, send out some follow-up materials. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, if you have questions, uh, if you have a story to share, we wanna hear from you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks everybody.